Good evening to those tuning in from the Middle East and good morning, good afternoon to folks tuning in from further west. My name is Salman Adkhayil, Director of Regional Development of the MIT Arab Alumni Association, a volunteer-run association that was established to connect MIT and the Arab world and create a space for alumni to collaborate and learn. Welcome to the webinar, Investing in Startups and SMEs in the Middle East, Insights from an Evolving Ecosystem. Our esteemed panelists today hail from Amam Ventures, an impact investment fund in Jordan focused on SMEs that are committed to diversity and inclusion, and the Innovative Startups and SMEs Fund, a private sector managed fund of funds supporting ecosystem development and job creation in Jordan. At the core of both entities is a drive to improve the quality of life of communities they reach through sustainable job creation and supporting the entry of underserved and underrepresented communities into the entrepreneurship space. This webinar will last for about an hour, and we'll start off by hearing from each of the MM Ventures team and ISSF team, after which we'll ask some questions we've prepared and then open up the floor to questions from the audience. And to participate in the Q&A session, please type your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen as uh, audio and voice participation are disabled in this webinar. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to the partners and co-founders of the MM Ventures team Tamara Abdel Jabir, Fida Tahir, and Jenny Atut Alzen. All right, welcome. Thank you, Salman. Uh, we are happy and excited to be here today. Um, and by way of introducing ourselves, uh, I can start with myself. Uh, I'm one of the three partners at Imam Ventures. I come from a management consulting and business advisory background. I've been uh, running my consulting business um, for the past 20 years, um, and I've worked in um, various Arab countries supporting large and uh, small organizations in uh, strategy execution and business transformation. Um, we'll tell you a bit uh, later about the virtual community that Fida and I co-founded, but that's also another thing that we are both involved in. So uh, over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Tamara. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Atut al uh, known have known Fida and Tamara for a good number of years, um, originally from Sweden, but I have lived in Jordan for 15 years now. Um, I have a background in the most immediate uh, place I was before we started Amam. I was in a, in a VC firm in Jordan, so we were investing in tech startups across the Middle East. Um, I also have a background in asset management, um, conventional asset management, so part of uh, managing mutual funds, prop books, what have you. So I come from the uh, investment background of things. And uh, yeah, we, you will hear from our third partner now, Fida, on the QGS. So over to you, Fida. Uh, so I can I start by saying that I am really lucky to be working with Tamara and Jenny. It has been uh, an amazing learning experience. I think I speak for the, the three of us when I say that. Uh, I bring the entrepreneurship flavor to the table here. I've started a couple of companies in tech. I think uh, entrepreneurship runs in the DNA of my family. Uh, both my parents, you know, have been starting, have been started uh, businesses, took risks before. And um, I've been involved with a number of initiatives and programs that aim to empower um, women specifically and youth and entrepreneurs in, uh, in general. Thank you very much. All righty. So I guess if I can, if I can jump uh, straight into some questions, if that's all right, uh, a little bit about MM. So uh, what was the impetus for creating MM Ventures? Um, and I think you alluded a little bit to it, Tamara, in the beginning, the, um, the group that you and Fida had created. So maybe, uh, you know, you can speak about that, its linkage to MM and kind of how it all got started. I think uh, uh, Jenny ha can uh, start this uh, because uh, she's an integral part of the story. And then I'm happily, I'll happily tell you about uh, Imam, uh, Women in Business Arabia, sorry. Sure, so yeah, let me kick off from the, uh, from the investing side. So I think we have to go back a few years, uh, at least my starting point, I don't have a, you know, a long history of, of, of looking at you know, women empowerment and equality and what have you. 
Um, but I think the starting point for me was the statistics that I came across. It was the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Index. And to me, you know, Jordan ranked one of the lowest in the world. And I was just shocked when I saw that. And at that point in time, this was at the height of the Me Too movement. So we wanted to have a conversation with, 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 with female entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. What are their challenges? What are their opportunities? And we called these meetups uh, afternoon teas. And it became very obvious for us um, really early on that there was a very, you know, there was a gap in VC funding towards women, um, particularly because you know, VC tend to focus on a certain type of company, right? And the, the women that we were meeting and seeing, they weren't necessarily building those type of companies. And when I say those type of companies, what do I mean? So usually when we talk about them, when we introduce um, a mom, we, we, give a, we like to give an example of a simple uh, venture capital fund. And it's very simplified just for the sake of getting the, you know, the, the, the example. But let's say that we have a fund with $10 million in it. And we want to make 10 investments. So we put 1 million into 10 different companies. Now, in VC, you know, there's high risk, high return. You often find that in general, on average, eight out of 10 companies, they fail. And when they fail, it's just total loss, right? So in this $10 million fund, we have 8 million that is gone. And we have two companies left, a million here and a million here, that needs to, number one, make up for the 8 million that we've lost, and then make up for maybe another 10 million to justify the returns of the fund. So each one company in a VC fund need to have the potential to make 10 million, 15 million, 20 million from that 1 million. So that means that the companies have to be able to make it big. So it's either you go big or you go home. And the companies and the, the, the women that we were meeting with, that wasn't the type of companies that they were building at all. So it was very clear for us early on, at least from my side, that we need to do a different type of fund with a different type of funding instrument, looking at the type of companies that the women are actually building. And I think, you know, it took us down a different path and um, a different type of animal. We can definitely talk about the business jungle later, but essentially, and also looking at VC, by the way, there's very few women in Jordan and in the region that are able to raise VC money. FIDA was one of them, for instance. So I'm gonna hand over to FIDA to talk a little bit about that background as well. And then the Women in Business Arabia with Tamara. Fida, you're on mute. Yeah, sure. So I think Jenny gave a, a very, um, I mean, very important overview about the, how women are not present in um, VC investments, uh, specifically because most of the companies and most of the women that we've been talking to you know, their dream is not to become the next Kareem or the next Souq or the next Facebook. They're building companies that they can pass on to their children. They're building companies that they can, you know, they don't want to exit after five years. Those are real companies. They, uh, those are the zebras that Jenny wants to talk about later on. So those are companies that are balancing profit with purpose. Um, they're often under, you know, they go under the radar. Nobody knows about them. They work in the companies that we're seeing are actually, they've never pitched to investors before. So, I mean, how are you expecting those companies that are not polished, that never pitched to investors before to come and, you know, be out there and be present? So um, maybe I'll hand over to Tamara to talk about uh, those women more that we've, we've managed to really get to know and talk to and, and support um, through our efforts in, in women in business. Thank you, Fida. So in 2017, Fida and I started this virtual community with the aim of bringing together a few women who are willing to uh, volunteer their time, pay it forward, and mentor other women business owners. Um, that virtual community grew to 45,000 members 
nowadays uh, um, from all across the region. It's called Women in Business Arabia. And through that uh, uh, virtual community, uh, we were able to identify a lot of the gaps that Jenny tapped on, that Fida tapped on, but even more, um, whether it's uh, um, the existence of uh, or the showcasing of female role models in the Arab region, women on boards, access to knowledge, of course, access to uh, um, finance. So, um, and with 20% of my our members at Women in Business Arabia being business owners, we learned a lot about what women in this part of the world need. And uh, that's why we felt that we can help address some of those gaps. So Jenny Fida and I come from very diversified backgrounds, but we are unified by the purpose and the true passion of addressing and filling some of those gaps. And when it came to helping um, those uh, uh, businesses, we figured that uh, we needed to have a gender lens. And when defining our gender lens, we wanted to take something that's a bit more uh, holistic. So we selected the 2x challenge criteria, uh, which is uh, the gender lens that's used by the G7 countries in uh, promoting women entrepreneurship globally. Um, in that, or under that criteria, we're looking at businesses that have female founders um, have, or have females in senior leadership or have a certain percentage of female employees or produce products or services that cater for women and girls. So it's a wide gender lens, but all in all, it supports Towards, uh, inclusion and promotes equal opportunities. If I may add just something here really quickly, it's that, you know, we've been, we've, we were able to design AMAM and we were able to design the business uh, development support component of AMAM just because we started listening. We started listening to the ecosystem, to the women and to the men, to, the, to those companies that honestly have been underserved for a very long time. We started listening to their needs before we, you know, in order for us to be able to design something that can really truly benefit the ecosystem. Okay, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. I will, I'm, okay. I'd like to ask you another question about maybe digging a bit deeper about how Amam works. Um, so, so you say there, so Jenny comes from a background, I think of VC within Jordan and also I think Fide, you mentioned, you know, we've been kind of listening to the ecosystem. Um, and then I think after this question, it would be a natural segue to Hassan, who can connect us with what he's been seeing as well in the ecosystem and how it's changed over time. But if I can just ask, so in, in terms of, you know, what you've been hearing from the ecosystem and what you've learned from, from uh, real women entrepreneurs uh, on the ground, how is that translated into Amam's design? You know, wh how do you operate differently? You mentioned something around the zebra, and then you mentioned, I think, some, so, uh, so how do you think you, you, you stand out and you operate differently? So before we talk about the zebras or why she talks about the zebras, Jenny should tell you about the name because that was a good starting point. Okay. Sure. Um, so we were sitting, you know, one day and we we're talking about, you know, we need to name this initiative and this fund and this program or whatever it was that we were wanted to do at the time. And it was weekend, I remember. And, uh, you know, every weekend we go to our holiday home in the north of Jordan. And I've been going on this road for the, every weekend, pretty much for the past, what, it was 14 years. And on that particular Friday morning, I saw the street sign that said, Amamak Matab. And I was like, you know, I know Matab, you know, it's a speed bump. And I know Uddamak because I've learned Amiya. I haven't learned the Fusha. So I asked uh, Mo, my husband, and I was like, Mo, what does Amamak mean? I had a feeling and, you know, I had kind of an idea what it meant. It's like, yeah, you know, it means future forward in the front coming up. And I thought, you know, hmm. I thought about it for a minute. And I said, no, this is kind of what, you know, that's kind of what we want to do, right, with, with our funds. So the next day on the Saturday, me and Fida, we were having, and Tamara, we were having our, our meeting. And I was like, you know, I think I might have a name. So I said, you know, how do you feel about Amam? And they're like, yes. We love it straight away. So, you know, it's also kind of signifies, you know, we want to put more women in the front, whether it's as founders, whether it is as senior managers, or even put them into the workforce. But it's also, you know, it's kind of ironic. It comes from a speed bump sign because, yeah, I mean, as women, as entrepreneurs, we go through a lot of speed bumps and we face a lot of those speed bumps along the way. So, yeah, that's uh, that's a little bit of the background on the um on the name. What was the other thing that we needed to talk about? Or is that, before, gonna... before that, I think Jenny, symbolism I think... is important. It's a great metaphor. Yeah. Mm. You know what? And I think this 
gives Jenny, you know, the local dimension that Jenny is local. You know, she's been living in Jordan for 14 years. She is the foreigner that actually came up with the Arabic name for the fund. So yeah, don't, yeah. don't be fooled by the blue eyes and the blonde hair. Jenny's one of us. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and a sort of the ahl al-balad that Fida has taught me to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, right? It's, is it about being born somewhere or having a nationality from there? Or is it actually how much you care and put into the place, um, which makes you a part of the place? Um, so yeah, so, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how Amam is, is maybe different from your conventional VC. I guess there are, there are a few things maybe that are, that are key, right? The, um, how you think about returns, perhaps the instrument you use, and maybe a few other salient points you, you'd like to mention. So Jenny, maybe you start with the zebras, the focus on the zebras, and then I'll take it from there. Okay, so um, again, you know, we were in our design thinking phase and we had come to the conclusion that you know the big companies the go big the go go big or go home concept wasn't really working for the ones that we were speaking to and we started looking around and say you know what else is out there and we came across this uh, these articles one was called zebras fix what unicorns break and you know we just had this like aha moment it's just like this is exactly what we've been talking about so it's not necessarily you know VC is not good and unicorns is not what we want. No, those companies are great, but Zebras is a lot more about, you know, it's much more down to earth. It's more about balancing profit with purpose. We're talking about shared prosperity. It isn't, you know, necessarily the winner takes it all type thing. It's not the concept of, you know, raise as much money as you can and burn it as fast as you can in order to, you know, build your product. So it's much more of a social um sustainable prosperity and a life that we kind of want to live in so that's that's a little bit more on the uh, uh on, on on the concept of the zebras versus you know your typical unicorns and it turns out that there's actually a global movement on this you know there is this whole business jungle out there whether it's camels or zebras or gazelles or elephants or gorillas or ponies or whatever but zebras is something that really reckon that you know resonates with us and also with a lot of the companies that we speak to as too. Okay, thank you for that. So, so how does that translate into you operating differently? So it's, it's the ethos is, is there. So what does that look like in terms of how Amam, you know, engages uh, potential, you know, entrepreneurs? So um, we have, we, I would say that we are ecosystem players. Uh, we try to build on um, whatever is, happening in the ecosystem around us and address the gaps. And um, part of that is uh, supporting entrepreneurs at different stages of their business in order for them to become deal flow for us, but deal flow also for other uh, financing institutions. Um, we provide strong technical support through our uh, um, technical assistance platform that we call Arkan, which is Pillars for Arabic, where uh, we are supporting the masses um, all the businesses, uh, the startups, the SMEs out there through digitized and democratized knowledge. We are also trying to uh, design and implement programs that help with the investment readiness and the business innovation of SMEs so that they're readier for investors. Like Fida uh, mentioned, a lot of those businesses have never uh, uh, talked or pitched to investors before. So we need to help them get uh, uh, ready. And then there are surgical interventions uh, that we are offering to the portfolio companies that we invest in. We create, uh, this is where my advisory background kicks in. We create those uh, um, uh, uh, advisory roadmaps or technical assistance roadmaps that are customized to the portfolio companies and support them uh, throughout a five-year period, our investment period, so that we're able to take them to point A, uh, from point A to point B and help them execute on their expansion plans. Um, when it comes to selecting the companies, uh, this is also another thing where we are different. We are targeting true SMEs. So we're looking at companies that are established, that have proven their business model, and that are uh, um, looking to expand, have clear expansion plans, and are looking for risk capital in order for them to grow. Another differentiator is the funding instrument that we use. And I think Fida uh, should talk about that. Sure. Um, 
So we're using, we're investing uh, using mezzanine financing, specifically a funding instrument called the Revenue Capital Instrument. Uh, and this instrument, we found it to be uh, fair. Um, and, you know, this is where we align our risks and our, um, you know, our strategy alongside with the entrepreneurs. Uh, it's a quasi equity instrument where we come in and take a small share of the company and extend a shareholder loan to the company. And this loan gets paid back over a period of five years by us taking a small percentage of the revenues. Uh, so it's a self liquidating instrument. So I think this is, uh, this is where most VCs in the region find, find it very stressful to go and search for that exit at the end of the investment period. At least this is one less thing that we have to worry about. Um, but you know, uh, Selman, and I think I mentioned that when we were chit-chatting before this, uh, this webinar, uh, this instrument that we're using and AMAM and the technical assistance that we're providing, it's, it's really what, what it's, it's real life. Um, when I was working on, um, on one of the Arkan programs, my mom, who actually started a business and she retired a couple of years ago, she was like, wow, so all this is for free for, I'm like, yeah, mama, it's, it's for free. But like, I wish somebody extended like 10% of what you guys are doing to those businesses. I would have able to, I would have been able to, to, uh, you know, to, uh, get around some mistakes, be able to scale faster and so on. So when my mom started her business, she started from home. She started as a home business. And then it was a two person business. And then she managed to grow her team to tens of employees, which means tens of families. And it took her 15 years to do that. And today, when we look at the companies that we're, we're talking to, you know, they don't, it, we, we want to save them uh, time. We want to save money and we want to, make sure that they are scaling as swiftly and as smoothly as possible, making just less expensive mistakes. Well, it makes a, lot, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you all. Maybe this is a, a natural point to, to, to rope Hassan in uh, to the conversation. So, so Hassan Shami is with us as well, uh, Investment Director at the ISSF in Jordan. Um, I think it's interesting if we just take a step back as of now. So, so we've had uh, the MM team talk about kind of the um, status quo as they've experienced it and then designed their entity around. It's, uh, first of all, given your vantage point of, of a kind of uh, a fund of funds and also having been an investment professional for a while. Sorry, I'll let you introduce yourself. I should probably do that in a second. But I just want to frame this. And know, I think it's extremely valuable as well to hear from you what you're seeing today from maybe the 30,000 meter level and as well how things have, have shifted over time. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kindly hand over to Hassan. Um, thank you, Salman, and thank you for having me. I mean, it's super delightful uh, to be on stage uh, with such phenomenal group of people. Uh, my name is Hassan. I am a consultant and a financier by training, and I'm a venture capital and private equity specialist in practice. Today, I'm the investment director at ISF, which is Jordan Fund of Funds, uh, which happens also to invest, uh, have invested in Imam. We're a big believer of the rock stars that you have here on stage, uh, 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 Salman. Um, I just wanna share my screen if you don't mind. Um, you know, very briefly, I'm gonna take you through a few slides just to take you through the, um, the ecosystem and the, and the evolving uh, nature that we had in the, in the past few years. I mean, obviously, um, one cannot start talking about, you know, uh, an ecosystem today uh, before addressing uh, the COVID in the room. And I think, you know, decoupling, investing from geography that we witness today is unlocking substantial value. In ISEP, for instance, we've done almost 30 investments, many of which we actually done over Zoom without basically meeting uh, the founders and basically meeting the teams, right, in person. Um, and had you asked me this question a year ago, would you invest in a company without seeing the, the people in person? I would say no way, right? So that alone is unlocking substantial window of opportunity. Um, I remember I was listening to a broadcast by Joey Foster. Joey Foster is one of the co-founders of Freebook. Uh, Joey Foster and his brother founded Reebok in 1958, and they exited, and it was acquired by Adidas in 2005 at $3.5 billion. Um, and in 2000, uh, 
And he was saying that it took him from 1958 till 1979 to enter the US market. And he was making his, his notes about you know, the speed that we're witnessing today, which is also unheard of. So I think we're super fortunate to be living in this era. And I genuinely think that 100 years from today, 100 years from today, probably people would not remember us, but they would definitely remember COVID. Now, venture capital is one of the most effective ways to deploy capital and create jobs that man has, has ever invented. Um, we at ICSF and ecosystem builders, we are obsessed with you know, tracing human capital and also um, uh, creating jobs. And it happens that VC and, and growth are two sides of the, of the same coin, given that you know, venture by design, it goes after companies with high growth rates. Um, governments in the region and MENA in the past few years realized that entrepreneurship is, the, is a driver of economic growth and jobs. Um, uh, in a study done by Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, um, um, taking data from more than 60 countries and over 70,000 entrepreneurs, they found out that 40% of the new jobs were created by just 4% of the companies being tracked. Um, when we look at ISF data, for instance, um, we took uh, be it direct investments or the, the startups that we are exposed to through indirect investments. We try to calculate what is the cost per job, right? In, in dollar value and VC money. So we took the information and we took the company since inception till today to calculate how much VC money is needed to create one job. And we came up with the number 50 to $52,000, meaning, that for every $50,000 venture capital is spending in, in startups, you're creating a new job. And this is only the direct jobs beside the indirect jobs that you're creating, you know, given that you know, uh, venture capital is going after, is creating quality jobs. And if you look at the ratio between direct and indirect, it's two to three jobs at the lowest quantum, meaning that for every billion that you're investing in venture capital, you're not only creating money, but you're also creating 2,000 to 6,000 jobs per you know, every and each one billion. Now, this is the, you know, uh, zooming a bit on you know, what's happening in the world and a bit more about MENA. Um, so globally, the funding has increased um, from 275 billion in 2019 up to 287 billion in 2020. Um, MENA funding increased from 870 million up to, one, uh, up to 1 billion in 2020. So out of the 287 billion global VC funding, MENA stands at $1 billion. Now, if you look at the ratio of spending of venture capital in the US, it's around 0.05%. If you do the calculation with the, with the MENA GDP, you are at around 15 to $16 billion in VC spending, meaning that you know, we're spending 1 billion and we have further room for growth at, um, at uh, 16 uh, um, uh, billion. And not mentioning that you know, in the Arabs, we spend between 200 billion to 1 trillion a year in donation and charity money. And that, that gives you a proxy about the, the, the spending power that we have today, right? And we're only spending one billion. Now, this is again, I'm not gonna spend much time here, but this is just zooming in on the countries uh, that we have in MENA and what's happening. So basically what happened in 2020, uh, the 2020 witnessed an increase of 13% in dollar value. Uh, so again, from 87 to, to 1 billion, but it showed a drop of 13% of the number of transactions, meaning that more money is going after less transaction. And, and that's normal, right? Because a lot of investors, they were shying away from traditional you know, sectors and they were moving to tech enabled sectors. Um, um, and you know, I believe that you know, in hopefully post recovery, we're gonna see more you know, uh, transaction dollar value and more transaction also in, in, in number of transactions. Now, the UE has topped the chart when it comes to um, um, a number of transactions and also value of transactions. And I think the UAE is showing a role model today, not only in attracting foreign funding and foreign direct investing, but also in nurturing 
and also attracting entrepreneurs from also you know other other countries as well. Uh, Egypt obviously is is a major player, and we can see a lot of deal flow, and a lot of the investors are actually looking at Egypt today. Uh, Saudis has has been you know has shown a substantial growth in in in, in VC spending in 2020. Uh, it increased by almost 55% 2020. Um, Jordan um, has been a dominant player in the in the past 10 years when it comes to pipeline and deflow in the region. In 2019, the World Economic Forum has shortlisted 100 companies from MENA, you know, to be the top 100 companies in, in MENA, and out of which 27 companies were Jordanians. So while you know, while Jordan uh, hosts six percent of the stocks in the region, the West actually listed 27 companies. Uh, of the 100 companies, you know, uh, based in, 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 in MENA. Fund of funds, what do we do very quickly? So instead of Hassan and team investing in 10 or 15 startups a year, right? We work with the rock stars that you have us in the panel, right? We work with, you know, Amam, we work the likes of Amam, uh, qualified fund managers, you know, so we can reach, we can increase our reach. So instead of having exposure to 10, 15 companies, we can have exposure to you know dozens of, of, of companies. Takeaways very quickly. Mena venture capital space is growing. Fund of funds are super instrumental, you know, to the development of the ecosystem in the region. ISSF, um, uh, Ajada, SBC, Waha Capital, Mubadala, and and many others. They are super critical to um, uh, to the development of the of the venture capital space. B, we need more fund managers. We need more people like Tamara, Fida, and Jenny, right? We need qualified fund managers who can introduce a disciplined approach to investing in the region. So we have more success stories in the, in the, in the region. No more spray and pray is allowed and acceptable by investors in the region. We need people with disciplined approach. And finally, if you are a startup today, jump ships now. I mean, if you want to create your own startups today, I mean, this is the time to do it now. There's a lot of funding in the region, and there's a lot of money roaming around venture capital. So it's a great opportunity to be in today. And finally, thank you so much for having me, and over to you, Salim. Thank you very much, Hassan. I think that was that was great. And also, I learned the new, uh, so anything alliterative and rhyming is fun. So spray and pray. I think um, people start hearing that a lot from me now. So, so thanks for that. Terf, I, I want to touch on something that you mentioned that I think is really important. So... Uh, the ecosystem itself, right? And needing, so rather than people just funding, you need people with a disciplined approach. So you need individuals with a disciplined approach. And also I would imagine you need an ecosystem with new types of players as well, right? Not only providing financing, but can you speak to, a, you know, a bit to what you're seeing in the world of kind of incubators or accelerators and how these, and are they playing um, uh, a role as expected or are they a little bit more, um, entities with labels that maybe they're still figuring out what their role is. And, and I'll maybe, after you answer, I can tell you a little bit about why I framed it that way. Here's the thing. I think what we're witnessing today, um, there's a shortage in, in, in pipeline in the region, um, meaning that there is much larger room today for incubators and accelerators today in the, in the region, right? Um, so, because at the end of the day, you can basically measure the success of incubators and accelerators based on how investable the companies graduating from, from these companies or these organizations are, right? So there's a lot of pressure today on these, um, especially the accelerators and incubators to actually to, um, um, to succeed. And there's also a lot of money going into the acceleration and the incubation space. So what we're seeing is that while investments are, you know, have a regional lens. So you'll see funds like Amam, they're Jordanian today, hopefully they'll become more regional as they go. But for acceleration and incubation, you see them more as country specific accelerators and incubators. And every country now in the region is trying to, it's, it's more of a race today, right? Because every country today has an incentive to push as many deal flow, quality deal flow to the market as much as they can. So we're seeing a lot of money, developmental money going to the acceleration and incubation space. And there's a lot of commercial money going to the funds. So you're creating the, the demand, right, by empowering and fostering new fund managers. And you're also creating the supply 
by supporting the, the accelerators and incubators. So, hey. so, so, so from your vantage point, so from what you do as well at ISSF, so you, all, so you fund funds based on certain criteria. Can you speak a bit about what that criteria is? So on uh, financial, social, uh, technical, and, and maybe how that um, uh, furthers or attempts to further the agenda of the fund of, of ISSF? So, so in ISF, I mean, um, our mandate is actually, so 50% we are after, so our KPI, you know, um, is to, to, to support 50% um, of our allocation is going to uh, emerging and new fund managers. Um, Salman, there is a handful of fund managers today in the region, right? If, 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 if you look 10 years ago, there are probably 10 players that they were in the region. Today, they're around 20 to, to 30, um, giving you know, the new funds that, come, that are coming up. I think everyone realized that if you're not gonna only, if you're gonna only uh, invest with experienced fund managers, we're not gonna go anywhere. So there's an incentive for everyone to invest in new fund managers. I think most importantly, when we look at fund managers, we look at the team and we look uh, into how, you know, the chemistry between the team. I was a fund manager in a former, um, uh, in a past life, right? And I remember how painful it is, you know, to, to actually create a team. I mean, one thing that we like about my, the team of Aman, for example, that when you ask a question today to Aman team, you know, they look into each other and they know who would answer that question. And that chemistry, you can't find it anywhere. And this is something that we really zoom in in, in ISF when it comes to uh, 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 fund uh, uh, selection of fund managers. The second thing is the value proposition and the thesis, right? What are you trying to accomplish? Can you actually deliver the message? And how, how, how actually reactive you are to, to uh, the entrepreneurs also in the market, right? So those are the, the three things that we look into uh, for now. But we understand you know, that you know, our region is growing and we're looking for more fund managers. Okay. Maybe last one, la last question, and then I, and we can start mixing, mixing and matching, perhaps. The last one I think is 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 um, so on the. Are what kind of uh, are you seeing any evolution in terms of the instruments used uh, regionally? Uh, yeah, I mean myself, Anna, when I heard about the revenue capital model that Amam had spoken about, I had not heard about it here before. So I'm curious, you know, uh, what types of instruments are you seeing um, that the VCs or or fund managers um, are using towards, uh, you know, to fulfill their criteria, so on financial returns or otherwise. Okay, so luckily what's happening that, okay, so five years ago, we did not, the, the average exit time was 12 to 15 years, right? So, and now we're, sh we're seeing a shorter span of exits now in the region, right? So now it's becoming shorter, uh, probably five to, to 10 years. So it was, you know, exit, has always been, you know, a question mark in the region. Now, you know, since 2018 till today, we've witnessed 61 exits in MENA. So you see more family offices interested in the venture capital space, giving the shorter span of exits. This is one. B, I think what, you know, what's beautiful about Aman, for instance, at the innovative instrument that they're showing and that they're providing is the option to actually liquidate an exit. Um, and I think, as we go, we'll see more emerging, you know, and we'll see more innovative uh, instruments. But I think Amam, they're taking the lead or they're taking a step ahead in front of, you know, other fund managers who do typical uh, equity instrument for now. But let me put it this way. Mostly it's equity, pure equity, and, you know, topped by that venture if available. Otherwise, you know, it's, more, it's, it's mostly equity. Okay. Okay, that's fair. Thank you. Thank you. I saw I saw some nods. I think from Fida and Tamara as as Hassan was speaking. So, I, uh, are there any reactions to anything Hassan has said that you'd like to speak to? Uh, I'd actually like to add one thing. Uh, we were part of an investment uh, of a sorry a fellowship program for first time fund managers, and that was a really really interesting program because Hassan is talking about you know wanting to see or the need to have new fund managers there. And Salman, you were asking also about, you know, the availability and the innov innovating in new instruments on the market. 
And how are you going to get that if you don't have new faces, if you don't have new fund managers? And how are you going to get new fund managers if there isn't you know, a way in the ecosystem, certain programs, certain fellowships in the ecosystem to actually prepare those first time fund managers? Um, so this uh, IFADA program, it was called IFADA. It was a very um, intensive and interesting fellowship that Tamara and I both attended um, for first time fund managers. It was also an opportunity for us to learn from other first time fund managers who were attending uh, this program with us. Um, the other thing is, uh, of course, ISSF, but also um, uh, our anchor investors, uh, DGGF, they have this interesting uh, approach uh, and opportunity that they enable first time fund managers and equip them to be able to, you know, they take the risk with them to launch. So they uh, basically supported us in that launch facility uh, that we're doing. So we can start creating track record. So we can start showing that there is pipeline in other sectors other than tech, that this instrument actually works. So we're doing that in parallel. We are going to be fundraising for our $30 million fund. That's, um, thank you for that. Actually, this is something that I'd not heard of, um, or I guess um, an angle from which I haven't looked, uh, but Hassan had mentioned it. Now you have in terms of grooming fund managers to actually be able to occupy those roles to then, to then do that job. Um, I guess, so you mentioned a little while ago, kind of um, the, the, the entity that provided, I guess, your anchor investor. So uh, that makes me think about, so traditional uh, VC uh, funding unexpected returns versus what you, what you all are doing right now, right? Which is VC funding, but not only with a focus on financial, but also social returns. How has that you know, played a role in your ability to raise funds and expand where and how you operate? So if you think of other Arab countries or kind of what kind of constraints and uh, maybe uh, enablement does that provide? Does that pose? Jenny, are you taking that? Yes, yeah, so I'm happy to talk a little bit about the, the social uh, return components, but I think also just to add a little bit to what Fita was saying earlier, I think a lot of people when they think about VC or fund managers or investment managers in general, you know, I know that they think that we're a little bit like of a black box, you know, they don't know much about us, we're always very secretive and, you know, we come, we're the ones with, you know, with the money uh, that they're all trying to, to secure, but really at the end of the, you know, the bottom line, we're also a startup, like we're also companies. So when, when you say that you have first time fund managers that come out there, you know, we need to go out and find our seed capital and our seed funding and our fundraising, and we have to find our product market fit, right? So we are in, we are very much in a similar situation that any other entrepreneurial startup um, is finding themselves in. So um, going back to the, the social returns versus the financial returns, um, again, going back to the VC example that I was telling you about, the 10, the 20, the 30x type of returns that a VC fund would be having, you know, typically would translate into an IRR of, on the fund of 20, 30% IRR. And if you look at the type of funding instruments that we're uh, utilizing, we will not be anywhere near those type of uh, return expectations on the uh, on the cash on cash. So if a, a VC investment does 10, 20, these type of um, investment would be making somewhere between two to three, maybe up to five X if we're really lucky. So that means that we are not going to be um, marketing ourselves as a VC fund in terms from a return perspective, but we do have a, uh, so, so, you know, from the financial return perspective, there are certain investors that we won't be attracted to. But when we look at the social return component, and this is where it gets really interesting because our impact, the way that we think about impact, it is as important as the financial return component. So, we are really looking at, for us, for instance, when we think of impact, one of the main components is gender, right? So when we make an investment, first of all, we have the eligibility criteria that Tamara was talking about, but we also have this, the concept of, you know, what is this transformational journey that this company is going on and that we can be part of that this investment will unlock. So 
we speak about social returns, you know, is that changing the culture? Is it getting more women into the senior management? Um, you know, it's also that concept of the social return on, on investment, which is, you know, it's not that easy to quantify, but, you know, we're definitely working on that component as well. But yes, um, the, the, in terms of fundraising, we are, we are not the type of fund that fits any kind of investor. We have a specific target investor in mind. And I think with the global movement towards ESG, towards being socially aware and conscious, there's a lot of momentum going on in, in, in the impact investing space. And I think gender in specific is something that a lot of investors are, they're very interested in. It's a hot topic. And for them, gender is a black box. So, you know, getting, um, um, you know, speaking to a fund manager like a mom, we can help them, you know, uncover what are some of those, you know, components inside that black box that is gender. So I spoke a lot, but um, I think you, you asked a little bit about the, the regional expansion as well. So I'll, I'll hand over to Tamara to speak about that part. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, absolutely, that's one of our next plans uh, because we saw that there is a clear gap across the region when it comes to impact investing, when it comes to gender lens uh, uh, investing. And um, we see the opportunity everywhere, but we decided that we need to be focused. And we felt that the technical assistance that we're providing is a good way for us to pilot and explore certain markets. Um, so it will help us understand uh, the market, understand the potential, the SMEs that are out there. And that's why we're starting with Egypt, hopefully very soon, but we are looking to uh, approach the other countries of the region because, again, we all have, uh, um, all the markets have gaps when it comes to gender, and there's a lot that all of us can do there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and perhaps, Hassan, uh, if, you, if, you'd like to, if you'd like to chime in on this one, so given kind of your vantage point, are there any uh, are there any countries within MENA, so uh, and as individual countries or groupings of countries where you're seeing interesting patterns um, on how the ecosystem of, is evolving, so uh, in terms of financing, um, the way returns are thought of, you know, social finance or, or otherwise, I mean, regulatory evolution? Here's the thing. I think for, for any country to be... Um, to, to make it happen and to be successful in... in, 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 in um, in, in the entrepreneurship and the VC space, they need three things. A, quality of life, B, uh, ease of flow, and ease of doing business, right? And I think, you know, everyone today is racing to achieve that objective collectively as a region, right? The Emiratis are doing this, the Bahrainis, the Saudis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians. I think we're all now racing in that, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a competition today. The good thing is that the region realized that unless that you play a holistic play between the entire, across the entire region, you will not succeed. I'll give you an example, Kareem, right? Kareem was established in Dubai by a, an American Pakistani, right? And a Swedish, a Swedish guy, and who actually managed to expand all over across MENA to be acquired by Uber. So all the stakeholders realized this, I mean, Here's the thing. I mean, we talk a lot to each other. We talk to the Saudis, we talk to the Emiratis, we talk to the Kuwaitis, we talk to the Bahrainis, we talk to the Egyptian. We know that we cannot succeed unilaterally. And I think this is something that is very well recognized in the past few years. Uh, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Um, I think actually there's a, so maybe I'll, I'll pause. Sorry, I've been, I've just I've been very selfish in asking my questions and reacting to the conversation. So maybe we should give the audience a little bit of room to, to ask some questions. I think there's one that's, um, that's a natural segue to, to what we were just discussing. Um, so this is from Ryan asking, I've heard most uh, funds really need a pan MENA investment remit given pipeline in the region versus country specific. But most funding for new managers is economic development or sovereign funding from governments that naturally want new managers to focus just on their countries or impose unique terms, which can actually make fundraising for a pan region uh, pretty challenging, pan region fund pretty challenging. Have you found that to be the case? If yes, what are some ways to reduce the fragmentation? Okay, so, so I'll take this one. I think, you know, speaking on behalf of uh, the fund of funds in the, in the region, I think the definition, we, we've been quite loose when it comes to the definition, right? 
So for ISSF, a Jordanian company is a company that operates in Jordan. So it could be domiciled anywhere, active anywhere, as long as it has some operation in Jordan. The, the, the main purpose for having fund of funds is basically to create jobs, right? The Saudis are doing this to create more opportunities for the Saudis. The Jordanians are doing the same thing, right? Um, so, so if a company exists in Saudi or UAE, is based in Saudi or UAE, and has a, an angle or a presence in Jordan, it is a Jordanian company by definition. Uh, so, so, so answer to your question, I think everyone recognized that you know, uh, we have to be quite flexible when it comes to our definitions for this to work. That makes sense, thank you. Um, we have another question from our audience. This is a question to Jenny. Uh, why has Amam chosen to be industry agnostic despite that most VCs globally are focusing on info, cyber tech, life sciences, and high tech startups? Yeah, I think that's that is a really interesting question, right? And I think when when we set out to design Amam, we we really and I think it goes back to the creation of the Women in Business Arabia Network and how Fidan Tamara was talking earlier about when we were creating our programs, we're actually asking them what it is that they need. So when we're looking at the pipeline of companies that <clears throat> fit our 2X criteria, our gender lens criteria, we mapped out the market and we looked at, you know, who are these companies? What sectors are they in? And we found that, yes, we do have a few in technology, but the great majority of the companies that fit our eligibility criteria, they don't fit in that main bucket. So they are mainly in education, they're in health and wellness, they are in food and beverage, they are in creative and design. Technology is one, yes. One, a little bit, you know, half and half now, less so, but tourism is another one. So instead of from what we were thinking, you know, let's not do a top down type of fund. Let's actually build our fund from the bottom up. So let's really look at what, what does the market look like? What does it need? What does the current funding um, landscape look like? There are plenty of funds that are available and stand ready to support tech funds and tech ventures. And there's more family businesses and family offices, sorry, that are now coming out to want to tap into that space. There's plenty of banks that are there ready to support and give loans and credit to the ones that have collateral, right? But in that space in between, the one that don't necessarily want to go to a bank or they're not bankable because they don't have that collateral requirements that are necessary and they're not fit that VC model. That's where we saw that there was a gap. So that's how we kind of married our, you know, let's look at the pipeline. Let's look at the funding landscape. And Amam is kind of the, the, the outcome of that. So that's why we are sector agnostic. But I mean, now in times of COVID, all of the companies that we look at, they are tech enabled, but we are not hardcore tech focused like some other VC funds are. I hope that answered the question, Amir. I think that's a great answer. Thank you, Jenny. I, uh, man, the questions keep coming in. All right. So, okay, we have one more. So a question for both Amam and Hassan. Um, and me, also, let me apologize to everyone and it, it, if it's getting darker on my end. I was sitting next to a window and now all the light has disappeared. So I hope you can see me still. Um, okay, so in MENA, mainly in Egypt, Jordan, and Palestine, there are a lot of development actors, e.g. the European Commission, the World Bank, etc., that are engaged and including substantial funds in supporting SMEs and entrepreneurship. So what is your experience or what are lessons learned to improve partnership efficacy between development actors and VCs? I can start with that. Uh, I think Tamara mentioned that we don't want to really invent the wheel here when it comes to uh, you know, providing non-financial supports. So we're really good at uh, what we like to call spider webbing. Uh, we work with a lot of those uh, you know, grant providers with a lot of those business development support providers to be able to build on uh, the successful programs and the impactful programs that they've already, that are already on the ground, uh, build on them to, to, to be able to provide a larger impact to the, to the ecosystem. So um, I think I started with that and maybe Tamara can uh, continue. 
just to add to that, uh, so uh, topics like access to finance, uh, access to technical assistance, impact, gender, uh, innovation are all uh, big on the agenda of developmental agencies, especially that remember that 2x challenge criteria or the $15 billion fund that G the G7 countries have put up for women to support women um, uh, entrepreneurship globally, they're implementing that through developmental agencies. So a lot of the big developmental agencies have within their mandate to support gender lens impact investing and related uh, initiatives. And that's why it became uh, a natural uh, um, path for them and for us as a fund uh, to find uh, uh, alignment and collaboration and implement joint programs like we're currently doing with technical assistance. Awesome, thank you. Well, Hassan, I guess I mean, it's also worth noting, right? So the ISSF, I think, as I understand, is partly funded as well by the World Bank. So. So are you also seeing a lot of, you know, what the team has just spoken about in terms of, um, you know, variables that matter to these developmental agencies and kind of looking more uh, closely at, uh, uh, you know, considering them when funding and if there may be other things as well that, that may not be considered that could be worth bringing to the table in these discussions um, uh, when funding is sought? So far, I mean, they had a brilliant experience with the, with the World Bank. As you rightfully mentioned, uh, um, uh, Salman, I mean, we're partially funded by the World Bank. I think what's interesting about, you know, having a partnership with such, you know, um, uh, such organization that A, it makes your fundraising process in the future much easier because they are very strict when it comes to governance and they have also very, you know, vocal when it comes to the KPIs, uh, be it, you know, a uh, 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 percentage for women, uh, be it youth, uh, be it the governance itself. So I think, I, I mean, also um, um, the idea is that, you know, the World Bank, the good thing that the World Bank, you know, had, had four or five experiences in MENA before they came to Jordan as well. Uh, so we basically capitalized on all the good experiences that, that they had before. But again, I think the upside to this, that it will make ISF for future fundraising much stronger. Mm. Makes sense. Carlos, once you've been a tried and kind of trusted partner, it, it's easier to, to enable the funds to flow. Okay. So uh, we have another follow-up. We have a follow-up question. Um, uh, so the question is, in Palestine and Jordan, Islamic and Christian awqaf, in addition to private traditional donations, uh, might be considered untapped substantial financial resources that could be part of the ecosystem. Are there any such, or have you tried to access any such opportunities in Jordan? So that's that's a really good question because uh, wakf or trusts are really untapped resources um, all across the region. Uh, um, historically, there uh, um, has been a walk for almost everything, a walk for horses um, who are growing old, that are growing old, a walk for house helps that break a pot and need to compensate the owner of a house. It's If you look at the history of walk, it's amazing. And that's why I say it's untapped because it's resources that are not deployed yet towards investing and supporting startups and uh, SMEs. We have haven't approached that uh, uh, yet because uh, in Jordan, uh, I would say that um, the organizations responsible for managing work are very are still traditional in their thinking. They're looking into real estate investments, uh, giving loans, etc. Uh, so there must be some uh, um, education and uh, awareness that needs to be done, possibly on our part, but also um, on the larger ecosystems uh, uh, part. But that's an example that's uh, that should be of a resource that should be tapped when it comes to private. Uh, uh, donations, etc. One thing that we've been thinking about is since we have that the, the large community of women in business Arabia, 45,000 members, we wanted to keep a chunk of the fundraising for Imam to be uh, um, fundraised through a, a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, so for instance, a million or $2 million, that's a very complex process, a very big undertaking. So we decided that we will be doing it in the uh, future when we've, you know, completed or almost completed our fundraising journey. And if I can add a little bit here as well, Please. what Tamara was saying, you know, the asset class of investing in private, privately held companies has 
you know, historically been, you know, restricted to large institutions or high net worth individuals. And I think since we have access to this amazing network and, you know, Arkan, our business development arm is about democratizing knowledge and technical assistance. It would be such a beautiful part of our story as well if we're able to democratize people's access to investments as well. So, um, you know, it kind of gives me goosebumps when I talk about it. But yeah, this is something in the future that we definitely would like to explore how we can get more people to get, you know, access to the type of investments that we're that we're looking to. So, yeah, it's exciting yeah, I, times for us. This is awesome. Thank you. And I swear this is not scripted to those watching because really this is my closing question. What excites you? Because I feel like it's on the same note. So kind of what excites you about what you are seeing or expecting in the world of the VC space you occupy? Um, and this is for all. I, I can start here. What excites me is uh, seeing more players, seeing more data out there, seeing successes that even us as Imam Ventures, we are celebrating. They're not our successes, but we're still celebrating. More importantly, seeing more focus on gender lens, on impact and innovation. For me, that's what's making me happy about watching what's happening around us. I we need to hear one excited also, point from every every person. Be, uh, before we, <laughs> otherwise, we can't let you go. So just. I think what's also exciting is, uh, and I don't want to sound like a pessimist here, but it's also exciting that we see that there is a gap that we can fill. We see that there's a gap that a lot of VCs and a lot of funds need to fill whether it's a funding gap or a business development gap. I think this is exciting. And this also gives me you know, a reason to wake up every day and, 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 and go to work and do what we do. Yeah, and now I'm the last one and Fit and Tamar has taken all the good ones, right? So- No, Hassan is still last, so no worries. You still have okay, to so, <laughs> Yeah, I guess what excites me is that there is a pace of change and I feel that the pace is picking up. You know, it's um, it's kind of like that snowballing effect, right? It's, it's, it's a rolling fast enough, I think not yet, but I do feel that, you know, change is coming, change is happening, and that excites me. And I also think that we are, other than just Amam Ventures doing what we're doing with our funding instrument, I think we are seeing more, you know, just just for the likes of Sequoia coming into the, you know, into the region, I think this is a, this is a big deal, right? And I think seeing a mixture of financing instruments, there's equity, there's debt. So the, the ecosystem is maturing, it is deepening, and that excites me. So now over to Hassan, to see what, what excites him. Nope, no pressure. This is the last note that everybody will remember of this webinar. <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, um, taking part, we're changing basically the landscape of investing in the region. Um, and we are only scratching the surface today, right? And I think there's so much room for growth. Uh, a week ago, I was, uh, I was with the ladies in the, their office and you know, I shared with them a story about OpenSoup. OpenSoup is a, is a Jordanian company that closed a $24 million round two weeks ago. And uh, it grew from four employees in 2011, and it's now around 250 people out of which 70 bought their first car from their paycheck from OpenSoup. You know, I think 14 or 17 couples have actually met in OpenSoup and got married. You know, these success stories, they make my day. And I think this is, you know, this is what we look for, you know, it, to see on, on a daily basis. So that, that's what really excites me. Uh, so much. Absolutely. Thanks for that. No, and it's, it's a very kind of human note, right, to end on. We talk about investment and funding and companies and stuff, but really what it translates into at the end of the day is like feeling a sense of purpose, you know, being excited, meeting people, developing a community, and then okay, improving the quality of your life. So, yeah, on that note, why, don't you, why don't you answer this question as well? What what exactly? well I, I don't operate in the VC space. I operate in, I'm a very boring investment banker, very typical asset classes, but who knows, maybe one day I'll I'll, uh, you know, relinquish my shirt for, for a T-shirt and uh, I'll come on over. <laughs> You're more than welcome to join us when you do. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I think this was a great conversation. It was a pleasure to have you all. I'm sure the audience enjoyed it as well. And you, you all can't see it, but I can tell you in the Q&A box, we have folks saying thank you so much. Very insightful. So, so we really appreciate it. Um, so thanks again. And to everybody else as well uh, who's following the MIT AAA content, we hope you like this. 
and stay tuned for the uh, next announcement for our next webinar. Take care, everyone. Be safe.